The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fifth chapter. They came to the other side of the sea and to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met Jesus. Now this man lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke into pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged Jesus, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and they were drowned in the sea. The swineherds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened, and they came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy God has shown you. And Jesus went, and the man went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, I know some of you are saying to yourself, wait a minute. This is All Saints Day and the appointed text for this year is from John. Why are we not reading John? It's because today is All Saints Day. And while yesterday was was Reformation Day, where we commemorate the Reformation of the Church by Martin Luther and the Reformation saints and and followers of Jesus. There's also another holiday that falls on October 31st, and that's Halloween. And I've got to admit that it's hard for me, the day after Halloween, to avoid the temptation to tell a ghost story. And and so we have Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 begins immediately following Jesus getting into a boat to get away from the crowds and all of a sudden the sea begins to to rise and the winds they blow and the waves are tossing the boat to and fro and everyone gets scared and they beg Jesus to fix it and so Jesus says peace be still and the water's calm and the wind goes away and I don't know sunshine comes out and birds are singing or something right and uh, so then All who saw this said, Who is this man that even the wind and the seas obey? And then Jesus steps out of the boat in chapter 5. And he comes to the man who is possessed by the demon. And the demon says to him, What are you doing with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? It's interesting to see that throughout all four Gospels, when the people of God are having trouble identifying who Jesus is, that the ones who recognize Jesus the most quickly are the forces that stand against him. You know, maybe that says something about the nature of human beings and creation in general. We're much more likely to be able to assess a threat than sometimes we are able to recognize a friend. And, and so I spent some time thinking about that this week. 
thinking about the demon, thinking about the man, thinking about the crowds, thinking about Jesus, thinking about the swines, or the swine, however you say that word. And one of the things that was pointed out as I was, as I was studying this week is that the, uh, the idea of pigs drowning because they run into the water is a little bit preposterous because every farmer who raises pigs know that pigs are able to swim. And so it makes me wonder, what is it that makes these pigs drown? And so we think about the demon inhabiting the man. And now this man, for quite some time, long enough that everyone had given up on him, was living in the tombs, in the catacombs. They had tried to restrain him. They had tried to chain him and shackle him. And he bent the chains and broke the shackles. Nobody could subdue him. And so there he was in living among the dead, wailing and bruising himself with rocks. And, you know, I can't imagine this is what his inner nature really was, that he would wail and bruise himself with rocks. And so it makes me wonder, you know, what is it that influences him to do this? It's the influence of the demons causing him to act against his nature by tormenting him. And I don't know whether it was the demon's intention to keep him alive or whether there was something he was holding on for, some shred of hope, some shred of humanity, maybe just plain out stubbornness, you know, to see what those demons did to those swine, that the very first thing they did with those pigs was drive, drive them out into the water to drown. I don't think that it was the intention of the demons to torment him, to spare him. I think the demons were out to destroy him. And so the man persists and the man has survived when all of a sudden Jesus steps out of the boat and the demons recognize him. Now, one of the things that isn't always clear on the first reading is that one of the very first things Jesus does upon step, set, step, setting foot outside the boat and recognizing that there is this demoniac who is in the tombs wailing and bruising himself with stones. Remember, it says, for Jesus had already ordered the demon to come out of the man. And so one of the very first things that Jesus does is tell the, tell the demon, come out. There's a couple scenes where we see Jesus say something like that. One of them I think about in the Gospel of John when Jesus is standing in front of a tomb and says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Or he sees Zacchaeus who's hiding in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. You know, get out of that tree. This is the second time I think in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus casts out demons. But these aren't any ordinary demons. These demons are tenacious. These demons hold on to this man. These demons aren't willing to go without a fight. And so they try to bargain with Jesus. And this is another thing that I think is really interesting. Because when we, when we look at this conversation, you know, Jesus, don't send us out of this man and out of the country. You know, don't banish us. Give us a shot to, to do one more thing. Send us into those pigs, and then you can be done with us. Isn't that fascinating? Send us into the pigs. Now, I do wonder, and the question was asked in, you know, Bible study on Friday morning, you know, who caused those pigs to drown? Was it the demons or was it Jesus? And I thought this was an interesting question, because when... When the question was first asked, my bet was on the demons. Because remember what I said earlier about, you know, the swine running into the, into the waters only to drown and pigs swim? And, and maybe it was the demons causing the, the pigs to go against their own nature to swim and instead drown and have one more last hurrah. And, and I really don't think that the demons necessarily intended to spare this man Maybe not ultimately. Maybe it was their intention to play with him for a little while until finally they drove him to his demise. But what if it was the power of Jesus that caused the pigs to drown? What if it was the power of Jesus 
saying to the demons, yeah, I'll give you what you want, but you're not going to like it at the end. What if it was the power of Jesus that caused the pigs to be driven into the waters? What if it was the power of Jesus that using the very same water that we use to baptize was demonstrating what happens when the forces of hell respond to the kingdom of God that has come near. Because that's really what the Gospel of Mark is all about. You know, I think the first lines that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of, of Mark are, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And interesting things happen when the kingdom of God comes near. Blind people see. Sick people are healed. Hungry people are fed. Wind and storms are calmed. And demons have no sway. I, I think it's also important to think about the historical context of, of this gospel because this was likely written shortly before the, the Roman raising of the temple in Jerusalem where where finally the tensions had grown so strong and hard between the people of God who, who were the Jewish people who lived in Jerusalem and were conquered by the Romans and the Roman occupiers, that finally in 70 AD the Romans said enough because the Jewish people had risen up in arms again. And so the Romans tore down the temple and ransacked the city and sent the Jewish people scattered to the winds. And what did they call the troops who do this? Legion. Now, isn't that interesting? Legion. What if this man is also, in addition to being a demoniac who's healed by Jesus, a, a metaphor for the subjugation of God's people of Israel? What if, what if this man is also a symbol for us of that bondage to sin from which we cannot free ourselves, recognizing that there are moments where the noise inside of us is so loud and so persistent and the cacophony of what is within us that is drowning out everything good about us will not stop. And all we can do to be able to make it stop is sometimes look for a way to control us and everybody knows that when we're in pain some, and when we're out of control and we feel like there's nothing that we can do, sometimes the only way we can main, maintain control is by doing something that hurts. Because sometimes pain is the only thing that feels real and the voice of Jesus calls out, come out of this person. And what's left when the noise stops? What's left when the voices are silenced? We look at this man from whom the demons were cast out. And we see someone who is different. When the voices of our demons are silenced, when when the narratives we tell us about how, tell ourselves about how awful we are are quiet, when the judgment of the world is held at bay, and the questions we have about our self-worth are put to rest, what fills that space? Sometimes it's emptiness because we're tired. For this man, it was Jesus. Because the people, when they returned, they came back to see that man sitting there clothed and quiet after wailing for so long. He had blessed peace. And the man says to Jesus, take me with you. You know, this is... This is the, the first step of discipleship in all four Gospels. Either Jesus invites or somebody volunteers. And the idea of this man bearing the sin of the community is a really interesting idea. Because if the pigs represent Rome, 
which a lot of scholars actually think so. And even though this was a Gentile city, there were some Jews in it. And, and not only that, but you think of how cozy a lot of the people who were subjugated by the powers of Rome got under that tyranny. You know, you had the temple authority and Herod, who, who was king of Israel, working hand in glove with Pontius Pilate. You know, one hand scratches the other so that we might not be able to choose our, our kings and our, our leadership, but we can get a little bit on the side to make us comfortable in our captivity. How many of us choose the gilded cages that, that feel more comfortable than some of the cold realities that come with our freedom? And what happens when the kingdom of God comes near is we can no longer make cozy alliances with the forces of hell. We, we no longer have the comforts of siding with those things that kill us and that destroy those around us. When the kingdom of God is near, all that is false is stripped away, and we are left with what is real. And we see the one who bore the sins, who bore the, the wounds, who, who bore the scars of that infestation, that possession, once he is healed and the swine are driven into the waters, what does he do? What fills that space that was filled with the cacophony of the Roman legion? This man goes and tells people what Jesus has done for him. Now these are people who are trying to convince Jesus to leave town because of what the kingdom of God being near has done to them. And when freedom comes, will we be ready? Now, this isn't like an altar call sermon where, give your heart to Jesus. This is a call to our hearts to remember what's important. That's what All Saints Day is about. All Saints Day is a day where we remember those who we love and we've lost. And we don't tell ghost stories. We tell stories about the people we love. We tell stories about the people we miss. We tell stories about how they make us feel. We tell stories about, about how they taught us to be. We tell stories about who they are as individuals. And it's interesting how over time those stories sort of do become caricatures. Because if your family is like mine, the stories change a little bit with every telling. And... Even though we're talking about people who were living and breathing, they take on kind of a two-dimensional character because they only exist in our memory in that way. And yet, sometimes we also experience those times in our lives where we feel like all we're doing is we're filling a role and there's nothing we can do about it. But when the kingdom of God comes near, the dead rise from their grave and they are no longer two-dimensional caricatures of what they were but once again, they have form and shape and breath and nuance and fullness of life. And when the kingdom of God comes near, we too come out of our graves in those places where we have put ourselves so that we too might experience life anew because where God is, the sure sign of God's presence is new creation. Because there is no power in the universe, not Rome or the United States military, that's more powerful than the coming of the kingdom of God and its nearness. This week, as, as we do spend some time remembering those we miss, remember that the kingdom of God is near for us. That God has spoken that word of love into our hearts and that word is our reality. How will we leave behind what possesses us so that we might live in the silence of the presence of God and see what God might give to fill that space? Amen.